¿Estamos? Ok. Hi, it's me again. So, uh, about uh, one or two years ago, uh, the application the company worked for, uh, we included a, a new possibility to uh, run faster certain things that generate a lot of data, okay? Uh, and because the, the amount of data was large, the time it took to process all of that was uh, also take, take long. Okay. So <clears throat> we implemented, for, for solving this problem, what we implemented was uh, multi-core support, meaning that we could process all of that in parallel. Well, that didn't solve the problem because now the users have the more power to generate even more data. Okay? That's the problem. So, we ended up with larger collections. And uh, So, what is a large collection in, in this context? A large collection in this context is not actually something extremely big, could be, but it's big enough uh, as to probably don't fit in memory. Uh, this could be because there are many elements in the collection, could be because the elements in the collection are themselves big, or it could be that you have many medium-sized collections, but all of them put together in memory create the problem of not having enough memory, okay? So, as, uh, so the question is, okay, what can small talkers do about that? And uh, so the, the first solution that uh, comes to mind, if, it, if potentially the collection doesn't fit in memory, well, let's put its items on disk, okay? So we created, this is like the obvious solution. Uh, so we created a subclass of uh, sequence, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, sequenciability collection or whatever the name is, and we call it store array. So a store array is basically an array that, but with, with elements uh, saved on disk. But, of course, an array in Smalltalk, the elements are objects. So you have to serialize the object in order to save them on disk. And, of course, this creates uh, s some problems because if you serialize the objects in this collection this way and this other collection you serialize in, in a different, at a different time, even if the same object is in both collections, would be set, when, when you retrieve the object, they w w will miss the, their identity, right? But for the, the application we had, <coughs> this wasn't a problem. Because basically our objects were like arrays of numbers themselves, or those sorts of things, where the identity wasn't a problem. So <coughs> it looked like very natural to create this subclass, uh, sort of array, and put uh, the elements uh, on a file uh, using a file string. And uh, of course, given that different elements have different sizes, when you serialize them, occupy a different number of bytes, you need to know the positions at which each of them uh, start. Their, their serialized representation starts in the file. So these positions are like the offsets. You have to put a stream uh, pointing to in order to load the next serialized version at that offset. So uh, the position is basically uh, um, this index, the object at index i is an offset such and such. And uh, there, uh, very quickly in, in the process, you add some ki kind of cache because 
Uh, retrieving an object means that you have to verify it from the um, serialized format, so it's expensive. So if you, uh, some cache won't hurt, will help. Um, there are a couple of ma uh, additional uh, instance variables that uh, I will explain later. So this is the idea. This is the format of the file. Okay? The blue box says how many elements are there in the array. You need that because then you need the array of positions or offsets and then you put the data. The data is the serialized object. Okay? So even though the green boxes look all this having the same as having the same size, they don't. Okay? But you know where to put the position of your stream because this information is in the yellow part of the file. And you have to keep the size uh, separate uh, just to know when the, the table of positions finishes and when the data starts. Okay? So this is very clear. Uh, the reason why... Um, so, if you, if you, if you uh, picture yourself, the file, it has like these three areas. Small one, then the table, and then the, the data. Okay? And the, both the blue and the yellow uh, parts have fixed size. Let's say four bytes. You can put more if you want, but four bytes is enough to have a pretty large array stored that way. So, so if you want to retrieve an object at in at certain index, what you do first is you check the cache. If it is in the cache, I do nothing. I retrieve what I have in the cache. Otherwise, I go to my position table and read the offset at that index. Then I position the stream at that offset, and then I load from that stream that is already well positioned to read that object. And load from is just the opposite to the serialization that we use when we put the object there. So the idea is to replicate the API of any array in a way that for the client or the user, uh, they, don't ha they don't have to know whether this is a normal array on an array stored on disk. Okay? That's why this method is important. So, it's pretty simple. And uh, once you load this, you update your cache and then return the object. Okay? This is a very simple cache of only one element. You can do fancier things if you want. So, in general, this is just to show how the the, the principal API, the messages we have to, to answer uh, uh, um, are implemented. You can imagine, we have seen art with uh, full detail, so output is similar, and add is, uh, you add uh, an object. Uh, I, I have to explain this a little bit, because uh, the array... Arrays usually don't have an add operation, okay? So, but here when, so this is mostly a read-only array, but you have to create the array. So, uh, uh, add could be handy if you uh, start from some, uh, from a size of, say, I don't know, 1,000 elements, and then you add one by one uh, um, until you fill up all the space that is reserved was, I, th I think I said, what's out. So, add is not that important, but uh, is there uh, for convenience. Uh, for instance, other operations that you use, we use in arrays is swap. We can swap two things. Here it's interesting because given that we have a sort of object table, we don't have to actually move the data. We only move the offsets. Okay, so we interchange the opposite. And you can do fancy things, things also for 
uh, all, all, all other kinds of uh, methods like uh, replace from here to here with this. You can, uh, in certain cases, if the two arrays are this kind of arrays, you can do uh, um, all the operation without having to refine or resolarizing things back to, uh, to put on disk. Uh, for instance, this is important if you want to sort the, 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 the array or something like that. So, it looked like the solution. So, problem solved. But, as usual, the solution of a problem is actually the next problem. Okay, because you start uh, understanding more things. Uh, is like an uh, exploration. So you have the, f the file where you, you have all the size, the positions, the data. And you start, so this is typically, typically pretty large. So you start reading and writing here, but remember I said we have multi core, so some parallel processing, so these things will happen not in sequence it's very likely that they happen uh, concurrently, okay? So you need to add to all of this that is trivial that I already explained, some critical block support so you lock uh, somehow uh, while you are, are reading or writing uh, to, to have uh, a consistent operation. So this creates a little bit more of work on, on, on this class, the story array. So, next part. So, you have, now you have all your objects in your model, and some of these objects are these store arrays. Okay? The blue ones are, say, normal objects living in memory, and the red one is one of these. But all this model is, let's say, this is the part of the user data. By the way, we don't use a database or uh, Gemstar or anything like that. So we have uh, we, we save um, uh, user data on file, okay? And how we uh, do that? We serialize the objects on file in the same way we serialize the elements of the array, okay? So <clears throat> the problem here is that you start serializing. You, you start tra transversing all, all the graph of objects and you start, so you like uh, send a normal object to the file and then eventually you reach one of these things. But one of these was, remember, was all the information was not in memory but in another file. So what we have to do is to forget that file and send now copy the content on that file on the new stream where we are serializing. Okay? Given that which file contains the data is irrelevant, uh, it's j just we have to change uh, the file name from the store array object. This is also trivial, but you have to, uh, to probably tweak your serialization routine to allow you to do this without having to be very aware that you are now serializing other things. So transparency here is like the challenge. That can be done, so you, it's, you have to, to write a couple of very short methods and you have this. And then you continue, you forget that file, probably remove that file from this, most likely, and then you keep serializing the other objects. So now, if this file represents all the user data that your application saves to this, one portion of this is the, where the store array content lives. And this is why this store array had these two additional instance variables offset at end and end, uh, meaning uh, in what part of the file uh, the, 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 the content uh, lives. Uh, when you start, you think you, you will have just one file for every array, okay? That's not the case. So this was like the, the, like, uh, 
the critical blocks uh, for locking the, the array was like the first thing we realized that we had to add, then this was probably the second. So we started to, to see that this easy solution had consequences. So this talk is about those consequences. So what about enumeration? When you have uh, a collection, you start to select and collect, or selecting and collecting uh, with blocks and, and operations through the collection, right? So imagine you, you want to select, uh, uh, this, this guy here receives the select uh, block message. So we don't know whether the select will have few or many uh, elements. So we don't know, in principle, whether we should use, again, a store array uh, or uh, an array in memory. So this becomes problematic because uh, if you keep the result in memory, you are back with the first problem. If you put this, if you use the solution of saving this on disk, then you create a lot, <laughs> potentially, millions of new, of new files on, on your system, and probably uh, for nothing because uh, the, the collection was short, the result wasn't that large. <clears throat> same with collect uh, with collect you already know the size is the same doesn't uh, change the size but uh, again this if we uh, collect and put everything in the new, in a new store array on this should be another file or something like that and so we will be creating too many things on file so the idea is try to how can we avoid making this decision? It's not an easy decision, and probably we are not forced to make this decision. So how can we solve this? Well, you create a new option, the derived collection. The derived collection is a, a new kind of collection that knows two blocks, the selector and the collector. So you actually don't save anything you just remember the select and the collect blocks. Okay? And then you dynamically resolve the select and collect operation, which could be only select or only collect or whatever. So this is the idea. The selector becomes this block and the collector becomes this block. So the operation of select or collect or, or the combination of both is immediate. You just create the object, okay? You are not doing anything, but uh, from the viewpoint of the client, it's, it's done. At the same time, given that all these operations are meant to run on many objects and are uh, inherently slow because you have to uh, reify objects from disk, it is a good idea to postpone as much as possible the actual uh, performance of those commands. Because probably you are selecting and collecting and then selecting again and doing all sorts of things, and, but this has a potential of uh, really happening. But sometimes it doesn't happen. Or sometimes the select block, some of the select blocks curtail the, the size, the number of elements very drastically so you don't have that problem. So the idea of postponing until the very late moment you really need to go and read the data is, is a good thing. It's a little bit surprising, uh, but what we, we, I'm, I'm saying now we test it in our software. So for, uh, at, at least for our needs, it solved lots of performance problems. So this is the direct collection thing. And the direct collection so has two blocks, the selector and the collector, also knows the root collection. <clears throat> In this case, is a store array that could be any other collection. doesn't have to be a store array, but we invented this for store arrays. And for these guys, uh, given that they haven't selected or collected anything, for them to know their size, for instance, is a problem because you have to to select, to actually select 
to to find the size and the, uh, and select at least at once to see whether they are empty or not. So we keep uh, them in instance variables and we try to maintain these instance variables and if we can deduce their values without going through the whole process, that's a good thing. Otherwise, we, we try to, to uh, update them uh, accordingly. And this could seem like a not really necessary addition, but again, this is what we found in our system by running uh, actual examples of on how these uh, objects are used. Okay, so th this is like the experience we had. So, um, interestingly enough, this uh, created uh, um, a huge improvement in, in, in the performance of, of uh, some operations to the level of, uh, for, the, for the user. Operations that have meaning for the user. So, this is how I picture, below is how I picture this derived collection. The red uh, circle is the root collection. Then we have a sort of filter that is the, represent the solid block. Then we have some transformer that is the collet block. Okay? And then we have two instance variables, the empty boolean and the size, which is a number, or is nil if we still don't know the size. So, for instance, well, I, you can see my picture better now. Okay? So, so for instance, how enumeration. Enumeration is not just select and collect. Then you have to enumerate on this because these are collections. Okay? Uh, so if you, for instance, the do enumeration, the, the basic one, the idea is we take the collection, we uh, select the do in the collection, and uh, for every item we in the collection, we um, um, evaluate the selector block, and then for those that pass uh, the selection, we evaluate the collector block. By the way, you can see that we uh, say empty false because the second part happens only if the first part succeeds. Uh, so uh, also take into account that this is a select and do message which is not select then do. <laughs> okay? It's only at the same time it's happening. Um, for other flavors of, of do, like do with, or with index do, we keep the index just in case. So this is pretty easy, and, uh, and we have the, the do. So we have the do in store array, but we have the do in this derived collection, and derived collection can be complex because we, you can select and collect again on them, which will like nest them inside others that have the same uh, shape. We will see this later in more detail. And, uh, well, um, at the end, this is how we update the size in case the size was nil. Because if we reach that point, that means that we transverse the entire uh, filter, collection through the filter, through the selector filter. So here, both uh, uh, additional um, instance variables, empty and size, are maintained. Of course, in any of these blocks, you can... Uh, return, so this could not be evaluated here. Uh, which could, uh, could be good because that would mean that you are not uh, transversing the entire collection. Which many times happens, like in detect or those, or those sort of or conform. The other flavors of the enumeration messages. So, empty uh, is, of course, if we already know whether this is empty or not, we use the instance variable. Uh, otherwise, if we know the size, we check whether the size is zero or not. But if we, if we don't uh, have any of those, well, perhaps the, the collection 
the, the collection inside this wrapper is empty because probably this collection inside the wrapper is one of these collections, so probably it knows whether it is empty or not. We use that information. Otherwise, we do at least once, okay, and exit as soon as we have at least one element. And by the way, we uh, update the empty uh, instance variable, and if we never exit from return from this do block, then we know that this is empty because we never iterated. Uh, here, this is a very small detail, but this is the kind of details you have to think whether uh, if you are doing this kind of tricks. Like, if you change collection, these two lines, the code is like equivalent, is the same. But uh, the reason why we put the col uh, check the collection first is because if the collection is of this class, it will enter the is empty method, which is this one, we will first go to the information that is ready from the instance variable. So it's a little bit better to do this way and, and not uh, with the other ordering. So we avoid the do if possible. Uh, here is an add. So this is not all the add, it's just the, this, the very uh, easy part. Uh, the selector is true, like select everything, if there is no selector block. You could say it's neat. There is no selector block. If there is no selector block, then this is, remember, the semantic is select and collect. If we select everything, it's just a collect, okay? So if it's just a collect, we collect that value and, and return it. So the interesting part happens when uh, you have to actually select, and then you have to use do, because to reach the index, an integer, you have to count how many times you move the pointer, let's say, uh, or the position, until you get this, because you don't know that you are resolving the selection at this point. And so in this case, you have to use do to uh, implement add. And if you uh, don't exit from the do block is because the integer uh, is too large. Uh, of course, this is uh, very expensive, okay? So, what you do? You create a new object, okay? So, because if I have to, to, uh, to send at one, then I have to do once. If I send now, at two, I have to, to do twice. If I now want at three, I have to do, do, do three. So it becomes n squared. The complexity became, becomes n squared. So it's very bad. So again, we create another object to, solve, to avoid doing that, to solving this problem. So the new object is a derived collection stream. Why stream? Because the stream will remember the last position it visited, which is the, the reason why uh, the ad was so expensive. Okay? So, again, we uh, have created a new object with the selector block. We grab the selector block from the original object, uh, the collector block the same, uh, the position initially is zero, and we create a stream uh, from the derived collection, uh, we, the, the original collection, we uh, create a read stream on that. So this is the way we create a read stream out of a derived collection. But the collection, so I'm a derived collection, I have a collection that perhaps is a derived collection that has a collection that itself could be. So this has different levels of nesting. And I'm sending to these collections read stream. Okay, but none of them is doing anything. They are all creating these stream wrappers that know the position in, the position in which they are, they are currently and wrap the things this way. So nothing happens. Everything is instantaneous and with one more class 
uh, you essentially solve the problem. We will see a little bit more now. But before doing the solution, uh, or checking that this is a solution, uh, again, you have a pro think of this. You have a problem of space, so you create a new class, the store array. Then you want to select or collect or both, then you create a new class and do nothing but wrap the operation and postpone executing the operation until the last minute. Then you want to add or do things like restream. Uh, you discover they are the same, so you create a new class. But the restream will have their own, its own problems. So we don't want to cure it, okay? So the pro you solve all this problem if uh, eventually <laughs> this uh, process of wrapping things and creating new classes stops. And it stops here. Let's see how. So how is the next method implemented here? Well, uh, we have a stream that works for my internal collection. So if the stream is not at n, I ask that collection next. If that collection is, is of uh, a stream, sorry, my internal stream, is the stream is streaming from a collection that is like my collection, the, the, the next in the second line would be this next, okay? Until we reach an actual collection or an actual stream. Then we select the item and remember, we are, when we select, we are sending both the object and the position to support with index do and those sort of things. So, uh, but now I know the position because it's the position of the stream and I know the, the item so I can um, evaluate the selector block to see if this is selected or not. If it is selecting, selected, then I update my position by one, I have just read the next one, and I now collect the item and return the, the result. Because remember, the, uh, we have to first select and then collect. Okay? If um, we select nothing, then we were at the end of the stream, so we uh, s signal an exception. Okay? Peak is very similar. Uh, the, the only difference is that there is no uh, error signaling at the end. Pick returns nil if we are at n, and also there is no updating of the position of the stream because pick uh, keeps the position. So it's very good. Uh, so um, at n is my internal stream is at n, or if I pick, I get nothing. So this closes the problem. Okay. Now, uh, think of, uh, of, the, of the product. Uh, you have collections created by the user with many items, probably several of them, and you have to present those collection, collections in the GUI for the user to see. Uh, if the collections, you present them in a list, then the user will only see one page or screen at the time. So, so you are never bringing to, into memory everything but the number of lines you are trying to show. Uh, this is okay. But this, if, if, we, if we think in this user interface of a table, the, uh, the table may have several uh, columns. And users want to sort by one column on the other, or the other. Okay? So sorting becomes also a command we want to support, right? And sorting should be as fast as possible because the user is waiting and is very impatient. So, so what can we do in this case? What we can do is to create another object that what it does is wraps the collection and um, so imagine, I, w I think I can show this here. Yes, look at, at, at the, the top row. This is like the composition of several commands, select and collect. So we select and collect, then we select and collect again and again and again, several times. 
because that's the way we use uh, collections in small talk. Okay? So you can, if you think for a moment, you can send all the selections at the beginning and all the collections at the end. Not for free, but with one iteration you can do that. So you can um, enumerate the root collection only once and uh, move all, all the, the selects into a, an index, a table of numbers that represents which of the original indexes, this is a, a real collection, it's not the wrapper, okay? Uh, uh, will pass all the selects then collect, okay? It's a little bit tricky because you don't just select, select, select. You select, collect, so you transform. Now you select on the transformation. But if with only one pass, um, and a recursive method, I will show you the method, it's very short, you can uh, build this index. So, for instance, if the combination of all these index ended up with only, I don't know, three elements being selected from this collection and these elements in this collection have number 1, 5, and 7, then this will be 1, 5, and 7. Okay? And uh, so uh, my first element is the first element of the collection. My second element is the fifth element of the collection. And my third element is the seventh uh, element of the collection. So if I have the array of the indexes that succeed in all selections, I, ha I know I have like the select capture in, in this table. And, and the collectors are blocks, so we put all of them in, in an order collection and then we apply uh, one after the other, the other until we transform completely an original element from the collection. Uh, so, if we say how then this, this works, if the, the result uh, of that thing over there uh, uh, receives the message at some index i, it will look the uh, index into the original collection um, in, the, in the index table, so this i will be transformed in something else, let's say j. We will then grab this element, and then we will transform by applying all the collection blocks one after the other until we get the result. Okay? So, here is how we create one of these things. It's, again, it's a wrapper on a derived collection, so a uh, derived collection can uh, understand, understands the root collection message, which if it, its collection is a normal collection, that's the root collection. If its collection is itself a, is a wrapper, it will send the same message to the wrapper until we reach the original collection. So that's how root collection is implemented. Indexes is the process I described. Uh, so I ask the indexes to my derived collection, and these are my indexes, and I collect then all my collectors um, into another collection, or the collectors from my um, uh, my parts. So now that we have this, now we can sort, and sort becomes something just very simple because. Given that we have the indexes, again, the only we have to sort are the indexes. We don't have to move anything around, just the indexes. So this is, if we receive a block, we produce a new block that express the same desire, but with the indexes. Okay? So, doesn't matter the details. I, this is here to show you that this is very, very simple, very short. This is the actual code. Uh, this is how I apply one transformation after the other, and um, and I'm I'm running out of time, but uh, I already presented everything. Just few, very few things, like conclusions. Uh, the not enough memory error messages are 
are gone. All the, the methods, the clients that interact with these objects, are, they don't know, they, they don't have to change. They are totally agnostic of these few classes we have created. Uh, the GUI code also, we haven't to change that and, and now works much faster. And in the process, we've we have a lot of fun for many problems that have no apparent solution and there are more things to do. So that's all. Thank you. You can ask you can ask questions if you want. Uh, I think that so I think that you point here and I think that you reinvented something that exists already in uh, many languages and including uh So uh, I did some, some research and I find that in Clojure it's called lazy sequences. In Java 8 it's called strings. Lucas Randy implemented something years ago that's called containers and that's went on string. And they met it's called that string and there was the name in the record. And I think that you should reuse this instead of recreating uh, yeah. that looks very, very similar. Yes, uh, I am aware that uh, we didn't at the beginning because we thought this is just the store array, so I don't have to read anything, just implement that. Then the next problem, then the next problem. Then can, I guess um, uh, for me it would be much um, fruitful to read all of this or to learn of these papers or other implementations after having tried it myself. I think that's the way I learn. Um, and I'm a li uh, but I must confess that I'm a little bit lazy of using somebody else's code. I prefer to write my own, but um, it's probably not the best idea, but it's, I don't know, that, that's the way I am. But in any case, I will learn all, all those, of those things, and, uh, but now from a different perspective, because I'm not the people in, in the classroom, I'm now someone that has tried and I'm sure what I will found there is much better than this. I'm sure. But I will understand that uh, better also. Just, just that uh, in Pablo, we would, like, we would like that to be implemented and be part of Pablo. Uh, something like everything else just said. Uh, so if you're interested in, in doing it uh, uh, properly using the, the, the existing uh, abstractions that all users are using, then uh, you should contact uh, you should like Stefan, uh, because we are trying to build something like that. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay. okay. Anything else? Uh, this year. Uh, well, I don't use my own code. <laughs> no, I don't remember. Do you mean I? I did something, or you? I did something similar. Oh. It's possible. <laughs> okay, thank you. Este.